there is a focus not only on the math content, you know, so can you add, can you subtract, can you multiply, but there's a focus on how do you do the math, the mathematical practices. So we're looking for students who can make sense of math problems, who can per persevere, so they don't just give up. They have more than one way to solve, not just the equation. Um, they're able to construct viable arguments. That means that they're able to give an opinion about their strategy and how it worked, and maybe I agree or disagree with yours, but I can explain why. And they're able to model it. They're able to show the math. So I'm going to give you a structure today that's going to help you help your kids show the math, make sense of the math, and then explain their thinking around it. Okay? That's only for the um, practices that are come for. So there I am doing the math. Sometimes in order to do the math, you've got to get down on the ground. Anybody? Kindergarten, first grade, <coughs> teacher, anyone? Okay. You know about getting down on the ground sometimes, right? I am in a um, K-1 class. We have K-1 and K-2. And these students are focused on measuring and estimating, and they're comparing my size to the size of the alligator. And they're using key language like larger, um, less than, smaller than. So that's me there doing the math. And this is a, a research-based strategy that we're using and that many schools are using that I want you to focus on. And it moves students through a phase of first starting with the concrete. What does that mean? I build it. Okay? I build it. I actually do the math. Then I have an opportunity in the pictorial phase to see it. I draw it out. I make a picture of it. So I do it. I see it. And then finally, I get to the abstract. That's where we connect the math work to the equation by using numbers, symbols, and words. How many of you, when you were going to school, this is what you learned. You started here. I see some nodding heads. Okay, if you're not comfortable, raise your hand. That's that's the way I learned when I first went to school. Okay, but we really need to start here. We do the math. We see the math. And then we make the connection to the symbols. And there's a handout that I put on each of your seats, and it has it right at the top. I do it, I see it, and then I make sense of the symbols. Okay? So here's an example of doing the math, seeing the math, and then making sense of the symbols. And I'm going to use my favorite dessert, kanafa. Anybody know about kanafa? Oh, yeah. Let me tell you, I learned how to make that from scratch from one of my friend's mothers. It's probably one of the best moments of my life. So let's say I'm working with kanafa, and I'm focusing on fractions. We have fractions all the time, right? If you're cooking, um, you're sharing something with a friend. Kids like to share all the time out on the playground. So they know about fractions if you connect it to sharing, right? And I want them to understand that the most important thing about fractions is it's about its parts. I have something, a whole thing, and it's got parts, and I'm sharing it. So maybe I bring kanafa into the classroom. If you bring Kanafa into the classroom, I am sure that all of your kids will pay attention to you. Yeah. Now, Hershey bars, bring them in, snap them, look at the fractions. What do you notice about this Kanafa? Turn and talk to your neighbor. We need to get to know each other. What do you notice about the Kanafa? How many parts does it have? Turn and talk. I'll give you a second. Four parts. Four parts. Four parts. All right. We'll start these with that. And if you're not comfortable with bringing kanafa into the class, you can also use fraction circles or pizza, right? Fraction circles. And I have some up at the front if you want to look at them later. But this doesn't mean you need to go out shopping tomorrow and buy all this stuff in the store. There are plenty of things you already have at home to help you with fractions. Actually, so we do it. Yes. Sorry, I was just going to say. Actually, another nice one is the Cadbury bars. The, the, the chocolate the, bars, yes. they're not bars, circular. Yeah. Yes. A lot of children see fractions as being circular. Mm. And yes. actually the Capri's Dairy Milks. The Capri's Dairy Milks. Okay, milk. is one part out of four. Two fours, three fours, four fours. I have four fours in all. That gives me my one whole. I'm going to stop for a second. Are you with me or any questions so far? Because I want to make sure I don't go too fast. Okay. So here's another example of that. These are students doing the math. So that's the concrete stage, the first stage. They're working with 2D and 3D shapes. This is um, a K2 classroom. They're building it with clay. They're using bendable wire. They're using yarn. Um, so they're showing physically what those shapes look like. They're building it. Um, they're finding real world examples. This is a 3D shape here using the sun-made raisin box. And here are some students who are also cutting out images from magazines. This is from Middle East Executive Magazine. Um, 
So they're making a connection to where those shapes are in the real world. The rectangle could be the door, so that they see those shapes again in the real world, and they have a picture that they connect it to. All right? This student has used shapes to make a figure. What you see here is anchor charts. This one was made by a teacher. This one here um, is made by the student, and they're telling how many sides, how many angles, how many vertices there are, and so they're making a connection to the language. Okay? So now we're going to give it a try. In your packet, there are two pages. I want you to flip to the second page. <laughs> What is area? It's the measurement of the surface, basically. Yes. Not dead. Glad we have some. No. So I'm going to put it here in the corner. Measurement. Sorry, it's small. And then I give them some tiles that they can build with. So they have a little container of these, or maybe you want to use smaller square units. Okay. And what are we doing with those tiles? Uh, arranging them, filling them in, okay? Filling them in. And then eventually the whole thing is filled in. I can show repeated addition. 8 plus 8 plus 8 plus 8. Here's my first and second grade classes. They've been doing a lot of repeated addition. I can also look at the columns, can't I? Yes. How many are going down? Four. Four in this column? Four. 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 Or I could do repeated addition, or I could also do what else for my counting? Multiplication. Multiplication. I can, because we know whatever's in this row is the same in the yellow and the red and the green. Whatever's in this column, four, four, four. That gives me a connection to area equal in my length times my width. Okay? Because the length is how long it is. It's eight tiles long. The width is four is how thick it is. That's the full surface. Yes. Uh, do you think showing a video on the activity is equally effective as using hands-on activity? Yes and no. Sometimes when we do show videos, the most effective way is for kids to physically do it. And this morning, is if I, I actually had to talk to Michelle about making little bags for you guys with titles because I want you to also physically do it. Because the only way that you're going to feel comfortable doing it with your kids, and some of you are probably already doing it already, is to physically do it. And that's where you also <coughs> figure out where the mistakes might come up or what questions kids might have, different ways they might see it. I did this with not only our students but also our parents. We were talking about how we move children through the phases of physically doing the math and seeing it. Um, some of you drew this. I saw that some of you did the pictorial phase. I saw people on their sheets taking this and separating it and actually doing the drawing. I'm not going to do them all. I'm just going to show it, right? Show of hands if you did that. A little history lesson. What is area? Yes, the amount of space that covers a flat surface using square units. But originally, the definition was not about using square units. The area actually came from the amount of land that an oxen could plow in a day. And it's been happening for a very long time. So we've been using area for a very long time. What's the problem with basing your math measurement on an animal? Non-standard units. Maybe the animal holds every time. So the term then changed so that the definition included a measuring a flat surface using square area. Okay? Connection there? Do you know a little bit more about area? Now, question is we not only need to make sure that our children can do the math, but we also need to give children opportunities to think like mathematicians. And I was reading an excellent article just recently in the November issue of the NCTM math, um, magazine, Mathematics Teacher. And it talked about the importance of kids being flexible thinkers. And it talked about how often we do not give kids in a classroom setting a chance to actually think like mathematicians in the real world. And that how we often teach them the way we learned when we were kids, because it's the way that we live. The biggest piece for you to take away from this is that mathematicians in the workplace, in the real world, aren't just given always a set of questions to solve. They often have to come up with their own questions and they have to connect it to the situation at hand. 
They have to be flexible and they have to apply the math in more than one way. And they have to drive their own thinking. So we have to give our kids an opportunity to drive their own thinking and to make meaning of a math in a way that they're passionate about. Okay? So um, this is also key to it says develop mathematical meaning by posing questions, what if not? So if your kids solve it, you could say, well, what if that wasn't the case? What if the number was eight? Or what if that strategy didn't work? Could you think of another way? So here are some students connecting their own thinking of the mathematics in a way that makes sense to them and in a way that, that shows their passion. This is a fourth grade classroom. And they are, at the beginning of the year, <coughs> representing numbers. So they're showing numbers in standard form, in word form by spelling it out, and expanded form using the place value. But they're not just showing standard form, word form, and expanded form, which for some kids after a while, to them, would seem boring. They're actually doing it in posters. They were allowed to choose any continent, any country, any city of their choice. They had to research facts about that particular place. This is an example from a poster on Jamaica of the number of mobiles that 990,000 euros, and I love that he made the comparison, which would be 4,885,439 4, dirhams here in Dubai. Throw, that's how much money gets thrown into the Trevi fountain. So, how cool is that? I'm more fascinated about numbers when it's related to something in the real world. I actually didn't know that until this was in this project. Here's fifth grade. Um, this, this teacher started something called Destination Choice. And what she did is she would sit down with certain students. She did it with her high flies, but later she actually brought in all of the kids, where they looked at the math units. They talked about what were the standards, what were the big ideas around the math that those kids were going to need to know by the time they finished the unit. And then these kids actually designed their own projects. Here's a student in fifth grade who wants to be an trundle wheel out and rolled around the campus and figured out what the perimeter was of the entire area. He used a meter stick, he used a tape measure, and he used yarn. And what he did is he took the meter stick and he put it up the side of the wall, figured out the measurements from here to there as far as he could reach, and then estimated the additional part. And then he stood up on the balcony, dropped yarn down. There was actually a teaching assistant in the bush there cutting the base of the yarn. Then he laid the yarn out and measured it against the tape measure so he could figure out how long it was and kept all of his notes in this journal. And I'm going to tell you that I taught that student in fourth grade before he went to fifth grade, before I came to math coach. And we took him to um, Steve Jones, who had worked very closely on our campus with the architect. It was impressive. And every time I tell this story, I almost get ready to cry because this is a kid who was such a genius and so passionate, but had he not been given an opportunity to do it in a way that was enjoyable for him, he probably lose interest. Mm -hmm. This is another student in that class. This is awesome. She wanted her parents to remodel her bathroom. <laughs> so she sketched out the old version of it and what the new would look like. Um, she figured out what the area would be based on how many tiles and what the measurements were, what the skirting would be for the extra tiles to go around the rim. It out. And the back of that sheet is kind of fun. It's some ideas of math in Dubai. So maybe you want to go to Ibn Battuta and look for patterns in geometric shapes. Our fifth grade class actually used to do a field trip that was related to math at Ibn Battuta. Um, maybe you want to compare the height of the Burj Khalifa to other buildings. Or I've, we've seen a class um, a few years ago that actually took little unifix cubes and rebuilt. Maybe you want to graph the number of visitors to Dubai each year or the kids can graph things that are happening on a daily basis at school, using Ramadan hours to help students practice telling time on a clock. Most kids have digital clocks now. They have no idea how to use the old-fashioned analog clock to tell time. So just a few ideas for you to take with you that are doable. And with that, I thank your school because we're here to learn from each other. Yes. You know, if you know the brain works, the left side, it's, it's more like if you're giving your math, the right brain, you're active, you're more creative. <coughs> so bringing these two together can be a big task. What I'm hearing is the question is maybe based on which part of the brain we use more or maybe even our backgrounds and what we, how do we, where do we get these ideas from? And there's say one child learns by seeing, the other child learns by, and he said, okay, take your arms and fold them like you typically do. Just take your arms and fold them, the right one over the left. It's comfortable. You're used to it, right? It's a little awkward, isn't it? Yeah. Because we're not used to doing it.
But guess what? You learn best in situations where you're doing something that you're not used to doing. So I think the first piece is to say, we may have not learned that way when we were children, or maybe we haven't had enough professional development, but it's, we're, we're able to do it, we're capable of it, and our kids are. Now, where do we get these resources from? One place is here. This is great that KHDA is making this opportunity available for us to learn from each other. I've been in Dubai five years, and I don't know enough about the other schools that are here in this region. So I'm really excited about connecting with you. That's one way. Um, another way, and I wanted to make a list of resources, but I didn't have enough time, was um, I recommend Marilyn Burns. Do you guys know who Marilyn Burns is? I recommend um, maybe kindergarten through second grade. I'm thinking of Kathy Richardson. I went to one of her trainings and so did many of my colleagues and we've been using some of her resources and they're all manipulative based. It's all about building it and then seeing it and making the connection. Um, a lot of people also use um, Vanderwall. Vanderwall is okay. He's good but a lot of his work is based on Marilyn Burns. So start there. I don't want to give you too many things and then overwhelm you. Um, anyone that you would recommend, Michelle? For me, again, her resources have worked for me. And what I like about these two authors is that when you open it up, it makes sense. It's, it's the books about there's, She's an author and there's tons of books. There's stuff <coughs> online, there's things that if you wanted to purchase, you could. Um, same thing with Kathy Richardson. And Kathy Richardson, actually, if you go to, um, if you type her in, or you type in, Kathy Richardson works with the company, and I think she was actually the person who sent. I think Marilyn Burns also offers um, some online kind of webinars, and the NCTM site is phenomenal. That's just a world of excitement. Not only their magazines, but you can go on there and they'll give you some problem-solving activities. Everything you can imagine, NCTM has it. Okay, and I think that's enough to get you started. Yeah. One to less of one. Yes. What do you recommend, like say a third or fourth grader? <coughs> you know what? Honestly, I recommend that you keep doing it until the kids get the concepts. But we do we do recognize, um, and I would say largely middle school and high school. But the reality is, we still have sixth and seventh graders who are going in and don't know some of the concepts, and we are doing a disservice if we don't help them build it and see it. Um, I had some visuals that I won't have time to show you, but they are of students who are. Um, in fifth grade, also going into sixth grade, doing volume, but I do this thing called volume for breakfast. You know the little mini cereal boxes? Mm -hmm. You glue them together so it looks like a building, mm -hmm. so then kids can physically walk around it and see all of the sides and make sense of the volume, um, having started with area as a flat surface and how it builds up. Um, there are some examples of high school students who are making 3D models of um, geometric shapes so that they can talk more deeply about the dimensions and to do the math around it. So you never stop doing it, but you're right that you have to do math for kids is looking, is looking like this, but they still need to continue to make those connections to how it exists in the real world. So I would say after elementary, if the students are solid, have them do more project-based pieces like this because it's self-initiated and you can see along the way, do kids really have an understanding or not? Because if they do, they can apply it, they can explain to you the strategy, and they could probably show you in more than one way. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And thanks for participating. I appreciate that.